Hello and welcome to the Russian invasion of Ukraine, brought to you by the Center for Slavic, East European and Eurasian Studies, the College of Arts and Sciences, and the Goldberg Center for Teaching Excellence at The Ohio State University. My name is Angela Brentliner. I'm director of the Center for Slavic, East European and Eurasian Studies, and I'm also interim department chair at uh, the Department of Slavic, East Euro Slavic and East European Languages and Cultures at The Ohio State University, where I am also a professor of Slavic, mostly Russian literature and culture. I'll be your host and moderator today. Thank you so much for joining us. The Russian invasion of Ukraine has been described as a crime against peace, Europe's darkest hour since World War II. It is an attack that is sure to restructure the international order along with the lives of citizens in Ukraine and across the region. Why has Russia invaded and why now? How have Ukrainians responded to the threat of war and to the pressures from Russia over the years? What role does Ukrainian and, and Russian nationalism play in this crisis? What are the long-term patterns of Russian-Ukrainian relations? And what should the rest of the world do in the face of these actions? Today, today we bring together four experts on the region to help us understand, actually five experts, sorry, Today, we bring together five experts on the region to help us understand these tragic and world-changing events. Let's take a moment to get to know our panelists. First, Sean Conroy, PhD candidate in history at Ohio State University. Sean has been uh, planning archival research in Ukraine for some time for his dissertation on Ukrainian history. COVID and current events have derailed him somewhat, and he's back in the States now. Mariana Klotschko, Associate Professor of, Sociolo of Sociology at The Ohio State University. Uh, Mariana is a Ukrainian American and the president of the Ukrainian Cultural Association of Ohio. Philip Kopetz is a graduate fellow at Ohio State specializing in Ukraine. He writes Ukraine Unlocked, a weekly newsletter about the cultural, political, and economic developments in the country. Miroslava Mudrak, Professor Emeritus from the Department of History of Art at The Ohio State University. Also Ukrainian American, Miroslava has conducted research and written extensively about Ukrainian art and culture. Mikita Tyshenko, graduate student, Department of Slavic and East European Languages and Cultures at The Ohio State University. A native of Ukraine, Mikita teaches Russian language and has recently defended an MA paper on the representation of war in Ukrainian film. With that introduction, let me lay out the plan. Uh, we'll spend our time together answering questions about the invasion of Ukraine that you, the audience, have submitted to us. We received an enormous number of questions at registration, and we will start by working our way through those. If you're interested in asking a question now, please type it into the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. We will do our best to answer as many questions as we can during the hour we have. Now, let's begin. First, I want to start with Mariana. How have Ukrainians responded to the current invasion, to the threat of war, and to the pressure from Russia over the years? Well, the Russian invasion uh, started uh, in uh, 2014, really. So it's been going on for the last eight years. It's one of the last invasion, not that the, the Russia didn't try to take over Ukraine before in the past, but um, this time, just like in 2014, Ukrainians responded bravely. Uh, they're willing to fight the latest sociological survey of population as accurate as one can conduct the, this kind of sociological surveys at this time, uh, suggests that 70% of the population believes in victory um, and 91% um, of the population support the president, which for democratic country, it's quite unprecedented for a leader uh, of the country to have that much support. Um, so there's definitely hope for the best, uh, but at the same time, we need to acknowledge that the losses have been quite um, difficult, uh, quite tragic. Uh, the, the people are losing their lives, but they stay with resolve uh, and they're, they will be fighting to the end. Thank you. Sean, uh, what are your contacts in Ukraine saying? I know you've just returned from there recently. What types of communication are possible among Ukrainians and between Ukrainians and the rest of the world? Uh, so uh, my uh, host family that I lived with, I've been contacting them uh, still through Facebook Messenger. Uh, they are safe and sound. They are no longer in their apartments. Uh, I, they did not give a precise location, but uh, in all likelihood, they are probably in the uh, subway system. 
which is the safest spot uh, from uh, artillery strikes. Uh, a lot of these uh, subway systems were built in the Soviet period uh, to withstand uh, a nuclear strike. Uh, so they are the uh, they're deep underground and they're the most uh, secure place, at least in the capital, Kiev. Uh, so so but as so far, communication is still open. Internet is still uh, working. Uh, so Ukrainians are uh, able to communicate with each other uh, through uh, through the internet, through their social media and whatnot. Thank you. Nikita, how does this moment differ from the past eight years of military action in the self-styled independent republics and on the edges of Ukraine? Um, well, it goes without saying that it's a lot more intense. And what differs this time is that if formerly we saw a, an attempt to take over the regions that are mostly Russian speak or ethnically are Russians, right? We're talking about the east of Ukraine or southeast of Ukraine. Uh, last Thursday, multiple locations in Ukraine were uh, affected by the conflict and places like Ivano Frankivsk, which is in the west of Ukraine and is very Ukrainian speaking, uh, was targeted and bombed as well. So we're facing, uh, an invasion that is not necessarily based on uh, liberating uh, the Russian speakers like it used to be in 2014, right? When uh, the mission started as uh, setting the Russians of Ukraine free. Now it, uh, it affects the whole country. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, that's really, that, I think that probably is the way it feels. It was on the edges and now, of course, it's a full-fledged uh, air assault and invasion. Miroslava, where are Ukrainians looking for help? in the global community. What do they expect may happen? Well, there are various arenas where help is being sought. Um, um, given that I have much a lot of contact with uh, uh, academics and the intellectual world, I think uh, the main thing that is important uh, to note there is that there are people with influence um, outside of um, Ukraine, but also in Russia, who uh, could take a stand. People who have a following, people of talent who are wo world renowned, who could take a stand. Um, I think it's very important. Uh, well, the support that, we're, that we see is unprecedented, but uh, it could easily die as the news uh, turns to other things. Uh, but it's very important to keep this subject alive because um, as you said at your opening, um, the Russian people are also suffering and they're suffering from misinformation. And uh, the more that we can deliver uh, the truth about what is happening in Ukraine, uh, the, more, the closer we can get to uh, a civilization that deserves to, to exist on this globe. Uh, and right now we are on the edge of, of savagery, it's barbarism. And, um, and it's an isolation of the Russian people that really should not be. So I think anybody who has any kind of following, whether they're sports figures, dancers, opera singers, musicians, uh, anybody who has uh, a wide following, they should really actively get involved uh, in, um, in, in, in telling the truth about what is happening in Ukraine. Well, this is, so for me, as a, as a very active observer of things in Russia and Ukraine, and with, for, with someone who has um, uh, friends and contacts in both places, everyone I hear says this is a catastrophe. And the Russian people also believe this is a catastrophe in many cases, because they don't see uh, what where the end game is, what happens next. And so I guess I wanna ask Philip, I don't know if you have any insights into this question. What, what could Russia want from this war? What could be that end game that, or at least the end game that Putin has in mind? Well, you know, I think Putin views Russia as the center of the Slavic world. And so the goal of recapturing the great influence that the Soviet Union had would surely be one of his goals. So at the very least, removing the regime in Ukraine currently, the Zelensky regime, and placing in a regime that's more sympathetic to himself. Um, I think another goal would be to make Ukraine 
enforce the Minsk agreements of 2015 that um, started an armistice but haven't been really enforced because then Donetsk and Luhansk would be uh, for would be accepted back into Ukraine with special um, autonomy and they could veto any movement for Ukraine to join NATO or the European Union so Putin could retain influence over Ukraine without directly controlling them. Right, I think actually understanding the Minsk Accords, we're, we're already getting a little bit into the weeds, but the Minsk Accords come up and they're really very important um, because some Russians will say, well, if, if Ukraine had just followed the Minsk Accords, then we wouldn't be here. Uh, Sean, what do you think about those accords and about why uh, Russia is still insisting on them and why Ukraine uh, is not willing to consider them? Uh, so just real quick, uh, the most recent version of those accords, Minsk II, uh, was a product, it was after uh, Russia had directly intervened in the Russo-Ukrainian war. Uh, this was January 2015. Uh, there was a major battle at Debaltseva, and uh, Russian forces uh, basically forced Ukraine uh, into uh, negotiations, if you can call them that. Uh, and so the current Minsk agreement is the product of basically a Russian uh, route of Ukrainian forces back in 2015. Uh, and so the treaty as it stands, or the Minsk agreements as it stands, uh, Russia interprets it uh, differently than Ukraine does. Russia basically says, we are going to let these rebel forces remain in eastern Ukraine. They will then rejoin Ukraine, and then we can talk about uh, some type of political reforms. Whereas Ukraine sees the opposite, says, get rid of these uh, rebels with guns, uh, uh, take their guns away, uh, take their, uh, their all their cannons and, and weaponry, and then we'll talk about uh, reform, because if you have armed rebels uh, and you're talking about uh, reform, it's it's uh, understandably the Ukrainians are not agreeing to that interpretation. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I, it, it, it got very confusing there, didn't it, um, as to who is harming whom and who is acting. And that's been true since 2014, this idea of, of rebels. In many cases, it's not rebels at all. Um, so that is really uh, an important and complicated issue uh, on the border there of Ukraine. But um, I want to uh, uh, go to a couple of questions that are coming in from, uh, from our, our viewers right now. Um, Steve Rissing asks, uh, to what extent do the Russian speaking population of Ukraine, Ukraine want to be liberated by Russia? That's a really important question for us to address because that's the uh, the, the party line uh, coming out of Russia. Um, uh, Miroslava, what do you know about this, about this Russian speaking population? To what extent does, do, do they want to be Ukrainian? Well, <laughs> this is a long, long uh, uh, and enduring issue. First of all, during the entire, well, from the time of the Russian empire, uh, the Ukrainian language was banned. So Russian became uh, the lingua franca of the Ukrainian territories under the Tsars. During the Soviet period, the mingling of populations, the movement of populations from one republic to the next introduced more Russian as, and strengthening the idea of the lingua franca, Russian being the lingua franca. Um, during the Holodomor, when, uh, there was, when Stalin instigated uh, a genocide by famine in Eastern Ukraine, and the population was totally decimated. Russians came in to live in those villages. Uh, they were Russian speaking, obviously, and their descendants have continued to live there. And so uh, they see themselves as Ukrainians, but their language is Russian. So it's not an issue of a defending ethnicity, and it's not an issue of defending roots. It's a pretext to create a divide among people. Uh, just recently, I was watching the evacuation from the Balsevo, uh, busloads of people being taken from the Balsevo across the border to Rostov to Russia, uh, because uh, that's when Putin was beginning his uh, was uh, beginning his strike. 
And one woman said, look, you know, we are all neighbors. We are all family. Uh, Russian people are good. It's not about the language at all. But it has become a linguistic issue with this invasion. And even people who would normally speak Russian are beginning to speak Ukrainian just to demonstrate that they do not be, need to be saved and that they are part of a nation that lives on this territory that needs no assistance whatsoever from a dictator. Right. That I think is really important for us to emphasize that, uh, that there are Russian speaking Ukrainian citizens and Ukrainian speaking Ukrainian citizens, and some of them are ethnically Russian, some of them are ethnically Ukrainian, some of them are ethnically other things, it really doesn't matter, they are citizens of the country. Sean, you wanted to add something? Uh, I would just add that uh, a political scientist once described it to me as, uh, ask the Irish uh, if they're pro-English because they speak English. So, and you'll get your answer right there. And I think it's a similar situation with uh, uh, Russian speaking Ukrainians. Uh, just because they speak Russian does not mean that they are for uh, Russia as a country. Exactly, thank you for that. I think that's a really great analogy. A lot of people are using that Irish analogy. I think it really helps. Philip, you had your hand up? Yeah, I just wanted to add that, um, you know, I have a lot of friends in Kharkiv, which is a large, Russian speaking uh, city in Eastern Ukraine. And, you know, all of them speak Russian as their native language, but they view themselves as Ukrainians. They view Ukraine as a multilingual country. And they believe that the language you speak does not, is not representative of your culture. You know, they can speak Russian and still be a dedicated patriotic Ukrainian. Yeah. I heard, I heard something from Kharkiv that uh, somebody saying, you know, some of us speak Russian, some of us speak Ukrainian. What we're united by are, is our citizenship and our anger at what's going on. Mariana? And I think this is kind of universal uh, theme that we're seeing. And I myself is from Kharkiv. So I grew up surrounded by Russian language being everywhere. Most of the people I know in Kharkiv speak, um, speak Russian. Um, and yet after Russia had continued its, its massive invasion and started shelling the cities, and currently I'm hearing the latest uh, in case if, uh, if the audience is interested, I'm hearing reports of people losing their limbs uh, and constant shelling to the point where there are dead bodies in the street and there's no ability to move those dead bodies away because the shelling is so intense. And so of all the people that I know in Kharkiv right now who do speak Russian, but they see themselves as Ukrainian and they're shifting to speaking Ukrainian as much as they can, just like Miroslava had suggested before. And not a single person um, is now thinking if they even ever thought of Russians as, as, as friends and neighbors. And there's this uh, first day of, um, of the war in Shelling on Thursday, a lot of people were in disbelief. Even the days before I was speaking to my uncle and he would say, oh, there's no way, he's just uh, rattling the saber. There is no way they would go that far. And then when the Shelling started, whatever illusions people might have had, I think those illusions are not there anymore whatsoever. Yeah, thank you for that. So we have a question, we had a question early in our, in our hour here from Edward Hobbs, who wondered whether Putin is fearful of a stable democratic Ukraine on his border more than Ukraine jo joining NATO. So a democratic Ukraine would pose a threat to his autocratic control of Russia. Of course, NATO is a big part of this. Um, Nikita, maybe you have some insight into this question? Yes, yes, I do. I do think that uh, Ukraine's democracy and uh, the events of 2014 when we got to overthrow the government and get rid of the pro-Russian president that no longer listened to the nation was a very threatening him thing to Putin because he does have an army to fight with NATO, right? The, the, the military presence and the nuclear uh, weaponry is strong enough not to be afraid of NATO in case he needs to protect. And also there are other uh, NATO countries that are members of the NATO that border Russia, right? We talk about Lithuania and Estonia, they're, they're members already. And now Finland is considering too, but the democracy that is possible in the Slavic and a 
partly Russian speaking country is a threat to every to the image that he's been building at that point for 14 years and now for 22 years. And also the image of now of a young and less experienced politician who is successful in his endeavors in all of them. I was in Russia when he was elected and my Russian friend said to me, oh, if, if, if Ukraine was strong enough to elect Zelensky, maybe we could do that someday. Uh, maybe we could, Russians could be brave enough to somehow uh, elect a democratic leader. So one of our uh, questions from the audience is, uh, do you think there's a chance that this war will lead to a coup against Putin in Russia? And what will that mean? I don't want to be totally distracted by Putin, but it's a really good question. Um, who is interested in trying to tackle this one? Maybe Philip, what do you think? Uh, yeah, so there, I think there's been enough popular demonstrations throughout Russia. And, you know, there's been several um, high ranking oligarchs, celebrities um, speaking out against the war. Um, I think um, the Kremlin spokesman's daughter, uh, she posted something on social media a couple of days ago saying no to war. So there might be some um, internal rumblings within Putin's inner circle. So I think the, um, I guess the uh, instability in the country uh, could definitely make Putin's inner circle question um, committing a coup against him. Nikita? Mm -hmm. uh, just, just a brief comment. I don't think that at this stage a coup is a possibility because what Philip just mentioned, uh, the addresses of celebrities and businessmen, they all happen on the internet. And, and if I'm not mistaken, uh, only 40% of Russian population use Facebook or social media regularly. Most of the news that they get is from television and television is largely controlled by, uh, by Kremlin. So we're facing a situation where if not a coup, then the presence of the opposition will be a lot more tangible and visible because people do start questioning the, the what they see on the news and what they hear from the official sources and might get interested in uh, gathering as one political power. Yeah, thank you. Mar uh, Mariana? Um, and what I was trying to think about is that, of course, ideally, that would be nice. Kind of think about the bunker and Hitler in the bunker and just fast forward to that moment. Um, and that might be really a, a nice way for Russian elites then to blame everything on Putin and then give them an opportunity to save face and withdraw the, uh, the troops and just say, we didn't do anything like this. Unfortunately, though, it seems like as far as the really inner inner circles and from what we're hearing, Putin tends to surround, not, not really talk to too many people and uh, the people who have audience, especially live audience with him um, is very limited number. And I suspect what's going on. And again, I, uh, you all wish to be a fly on the wall and, and really see what's going on in those conversations. But it might be one of those echo chambers um, where another term for it is a, is a group thing where people get together in a small group and when they perceive the outside reality as, the, as, they're, as if they're surrounded by enemy, they tend to all fold on one particular solution. Uh, and that solution might not necessarily have anything to do with reality or rational thinking, but they all agree with this and no one dares to speak against it. And um, it, it might be the case that if Putin is listening to someone, uh, there's the degree of self-censorship and no one is willing to say anything uh, to him. That would be contrary to, to his uh, typical way of thinking or decision-making. Well, and as we know, Putin has been very isolated um, during this COVID uh, pandemic. So he has been uh, in what, what some people call the sanitary, sanitary uh, ward um, of, his, of his, his very own bunker. All right, I want to um, switch a little bit uh, and ask, uh, we have a question here about the church and the clergy. Um, and I think we're thinking both inside Ukraine and perhaps even in Russia or Poland or other neighboring countries. Miroslava, uh, what has, has the church and the clergy, the churches and the clergy uh, responded to these events, these most recent events and to the longer eight year war? Again, any question about contemporary Ukraine leads to historical questions. 
And the historical question that we need to focus on here is that the, uh, the church, uh, I'm gonna talk about the Orthodox Church. Um, uh, it was under the Moscow Patriarchate until several years ago. Uh, once the Ukrainian Patriarchate was founded, you have uh, a division in the population. The Moscow Patriar Patriarchate was part of the Russian state, the Russian state system. And when the Russian Orthodox priests uh, gave their homilies, those were political speeches. Uh, but we know that the faithful are very devout and they believe in their uh, fathers in their clergy, and they will follow instructions uh, like, you know, sheep. Uh, and so this posed a great problem for Ukraine. Uh, however, with the founding of the Ukrainian Patriarchate, and also with the strength of the Ukrainian Catholic Church, and the patriarch of the Ukrainian Catholic Church in Kyiv, um, religion has has just thrived. Faith, the faithful, the numbers of faithful have grown immensely. Um, the, the pride in their own uh, history, dating back to their adoption of Christianity from Byzantium, is a key issue for identifying as a Ukrainian. And so when Putin uh, tries to rewrite history and claim uh, Kiev Rus as the origins of Russia, uh, this is all just nonsense because the Ukrainians know where their or origins stem from. And it is a religious origin. That was, those were the first signs of a civilized state. It was a powerful political state in the 10th century, but religion strengthened it as a culture and strengthened the people as a people as, an, uh, as, a, as a polity. Um, maybe I didn't answer the question. No, that was really good. I really wanted you to go into kind of the long-term patterns of Russian-Ukrainian relations. So that's really, you know, one of the things that I think uh, is part of the Russian national myth is that, you know, we, we are descended from Kiev and Rus, which of course is not true. Boscovy was growing up parallel and later, significantly later. And when Kievan Rus ended up being incorporated into uh, empires, it was the Lithuanian Empire and the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealths and, and so on until uh, the partitions in the late 18th century. Now I'm, I'm getting into the weeds. So let me back up and ask the historian, Sean, your hands up. Uh, I just wanted to add uh, also uh, Protestantism, uh, different Protestant uh, churches uh, are very strong in Ukraine. Uh, the Baptists uh, have a long history in Ukraine and uh, were persecuted under uh, uh, the Soviet Union, uh, especially today, uh, ever since the Soviet collapse, uh, Ukraine gained its independence. Uh, Protestantism, uh, especially in Southern and Eastern Ukraine, uh, has really thrived. Uh, and just another difference between Ukrainians and Russians is because Ukraine is in a democratic system, however, however flawed, it is in, still in a democratic system. Ukrainians have that freedom of religion uh, that they can practice without uh, state interference. And uh, in contrast, in Russia, uh, Protestant churches are regularly harassed. Uh, I, I know of a, uh, a young man who was uh, studying to be a preacher uh, in Moscow, and they have to receive uh, basically instruction on what happens if you are delivering your sermon and the Russian police uh, uh, do a raid. So, so just another difference uh, between the two countries and just uh, the richness of, of how many different religions uh, uh, are in Ukraine and coexist and all believe, and, and Judaism as well. Uh, Judaism has, has, has really revived uh, since uh, the end of the Soviet Union. Uh, so it's just a very, very uh, rich country and, and everyone shares the sense that the land that they stand on, uh, they all share and is theirs. It is Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It's absolutely uh, 
the legacy of World War II is still very strong, certainly in the, in, in the Russian Federation, but also in Ukraine. And for Ukraine to be attacked like this, to be occupied again uh, after so many years, this is very, uh, very difficult uh, for the people of Ukraine. I wonder, so we, I, we can, we're kind of going back and forth between history and current events. And um, one question that really interests Americans, I think, is uh, what the role of energy plays and the pipelines uh, in causing this war. Um, Makita, do you have some insight into energy issues in Ukraine and in Europe? Oof, yes. So the, uh, the, the gas pipes and Ukraine. So since Ukraine becoming independent in 1991, we've been providing Europe with Russian gas by transferring transferring it through Ukraine. And in the beginning of the century, uh, the prices of gas and the prices of the cost of Ukraine services became a very big political issue that uh, partially led us into the revolution of 2014. But because Ukraine retaliated in 2014 and uh, decided not to incorporate with Russia anymore, Russia started investing into various other way, a lot less or a lot more demanding uh, money-wise and effort-wise into building pipes around Ukraine, which is extremely difficult and it requires so many more agreements, right? Because you don't, you just not, it's just not one country that you talk to, it's multiple. So it, there is a part of, you know, uh, Russia being uh, somewhat offended maybe or hurt by Ukraine. Ukraine's decision not to provide the services anymore. And now when we see that um, Germany, and Germany used to be the main strategic partner of Russia when we talk about uh, export of gas or just energy in general, Germany is refusing to cooperate. Uh, I think that uh, uh, invites more violence out of despair in Russia, among Russian uh, government. Thank you. Uh, Sean? And I would add that uh, Russia has used energy as a uh, weapon uh, for decades. Uh, back in the 2000s, uh, basically the formula was uh, Russia would uh, decide uh, to artificially hike up its gas prices for Ukraine. Uh, so Ukraine couldn't pay those uh, uh, hiked up prices, uh, Russia would say, okay, you need to, uh, we will lower the prices if you uh, do X, Y, and Z in politics. Uh, and say Ukraine does it, but Ukraine still had to pay for all this expensive gas. Ukraine takes all this extra debt. And then basically Russia has leverage to say, ah, oh, we'll, we'll take some of your debt away. You have to do some favors for us. So Nord Stream 2, uh, which is in the media a lot, uh, basically uh, Russia's effort to build another pipeline uh, that goes under the uh, Baltic, uh, basically to completely uh, go around Ukraine and pipe gas directly into Germany. Uh, and basically the strategic aspect of that is that Russia would no longer have to use uh, pipeline infrastructure uh, that goes through the U Ukraine, that goes through Ukraine. So uh, in case of an expanded conflict, as we see with Russia's invasion now, uh, Russia, uh, if Nord Stream 2 had gone online, Russia would not have had to worry about, say, bombing a pipeline that it needs to use to sell gas uh, to Western Europe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Philip? Yeah, I just want to say, like in the larger picture of Russia's um, power uh, in Europe with its energy, I mean, they provide over 60% of Germany, Hungary, Austria, and Slovakia's natural gas. And that's just to name a few. So when they want to turn up the political pressure, they turn down the natural gas pressure or they raise the prices. Um, so as Makita said earlier, now that these countries like Germany is not cooperating, um, with Russia, I think that there is, yes, more likely for lashing out and despair. That's a good way to put it. Well, and one of the things that we have not been thinking about since the fall of the Soviet Union and the rise, the, the rise of gas prices and rise of gas production in Russia, 
uh, natural uh, production of oil is. So that's what the money that Putin has been using to rearm uh, the military. That's the money that, the, that they've been coasting on. That's what their economy has been depending on. And uh, cutting that off and finding alternatives, even if they're expensive, um, is going to be a way to have better control over what's happening uh, in relationships with Russia. Mariana? And also, I just wanted to mention the most recent uh, experience was the gas politics. So um, Zelensky, when he came to power, he started kind of his little war against the oligarchs, the oligarchs specifically that have close ties with, with Russia, most notably Medvedchuk, who is uh, related in multiple ways to Putin and Putin's regime. And so when he did this, the response was to bump up the prices and start the population's response. And yet still Zelensky didn't back down. So we are hypothesizing here a little bit, but it could be that Putin started to realize, and that goes back to why military for the military incursions, why aggression, uh, and why now that he maybe started to realize, and what is it about Ukraine? I mean, we keep on talking, trying to understand Russia, but I think we also need to understand Ukraine. And what is it about Ukraine and its um, lack of desire to cooperate with Russia, its desire to stand up to Russian demands and uh, Ukrainian desire to not to back down and to be in charge of its own politics and not to be manipulated and uh, taken hostage uh, of the you know, gas pop pipeline. But this is a really important question that people really need, want to understand, you know, about NATO membership, about wh whether or not Ukraine is looking west, right? Um, is, are Ukrainians kind of Western looking? Do they want to be Europeans or uh, are they really happy to be in the middle? You know, um, Miroslava, can you talk a little bit about that idea of Ukraine as part of Europe and part of the West? And maybe bring in NATO if you can. I know it's this, some of this stuff is a little arcane. Um, uh, well, Ukraine, culturally speaking, has always been part of the West. Okay. Uh, if you look back at history, and I think history teaches us a lot, and it is what we need to ground our understanding of the present on. But um, from I mentioned Kiev Rus. Uh, uh, Kievan princesses marrying the French king. Uh, the relations with Europe, with the kingdoms of Europe were very close. Uh, if we go into uh, later centuries, um, the introduction of uh, manuscripts, the introduction of writing, the introduction of universities, these are all going parallel, these are developing parallel to Western civilizational values and principles. It's never been a foreign thought. Uh, Latin, Greek uh, was always taught in, in the Mohila Academy. Um, the, uh, even though Ukraine might have its own kind of religious roots in Byzantium, nonetheless, there, there, there was a kind of uh, aspiration and um, uh, I would say even bonding with Western values uh, in terms of what the church in the West uh, was doing in order to strengthen uh, the Catholic faith, for example. Um, so, Ukraine has its own kind of reformation movement. Ukraine has its own Baroque movement. As a matter of fact, in the 17th century, um, the Baroque uh, took on a designation that was uh, indigenous. I mean, it had Baroque features as you would see in Rome or, or anywhere in Europe, but it was called the Cossack Baroque. Uh, and it, it, it is a marker of a kind of a national style which the Russians have tried to destroy over and over again, primarily because it was initiated by the Hetman Mazepa, uh, the, the, who of the famed uh, uh, Battle of Poltava, where Peter uh, the first defeated Mazepa and the Swedish king. But 
after after that, Mazeppa was anathematized, uh, but he was able to build churches. He was able to restore the Byzantine culture. He was able to restore education. And it continued that way into the 20th century. We have to skip over the 19th century because under the Russian empire, there were no opportunities for self-development, for cultural development, no academies, no press, no English, uh, no Ukrainian language, which publications, but come the revolution, come the loss of the empire, Ukraine again sought independence. And in seeking independence, it modeled itself on the West once again. And we have this huge renaissance, cultural renaissance in the 1920s uh, that is on a par with the avant-garde of Europe, of Germany in the very same years. However, it was quashed by Stalin uh, in the 30s. And so again, another disruption, another interruption in the general evolutionary cultural flow of Ukraine. Again, I think I've gotten off track, but- uh, No, no, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. It was right. about and Europe. It was about Europe, yes. Exactly, and when we think about, you know, we talk in Russian history, we talk about Peter the First, Peter the Great, so-called, who uh, broke a window through to the West, uh, somewhat violently perhaps causing Russia to try to turn towards Europe. Um, uh, Ukraine was already there, right? And that's one of the things that we need to emphasize. Okay, so I want to, uh, I'm gonna wait a minute to talk about uh, the question of how people in Columbus can help, but I don't wanna forget, we'll get to that question. It's really important. I know a lot of people want to actively do something and they're looking to us to get some insights into that. Um, but let's talk about, blame a little bit. And Sean, I want to ask you this. There are commentators globally who blame this war on the US to some extent, um, or on Ukraine itself. Can you imagine what the excuses are, what the reasons are for blaming the US here? And are we in some ways at fault? Uh, so the narrative that the US is at fault uh, ties into uh, Russia's uh, perspective. They think that uh, the US uh, is basically behind uh, everything as, as sort of like uh, controlling uh, Eastern Europe as a puppet, uh, turning Ukrainians against Russians. Uh, and basically, this uh, whole Russian narrative that blames the that talks about the US is in a way just ignoring Ukraine from the conversation because what Russia would like to do is to say let's just put Ukraine off the table let's talk the US uh, and Russia because Russia uh, especially Putin uh, is trying to uh, gain prestige he's trying to present himself and thereby present his vision of Russia as this great state uh, and he would rather uh, talk uh, directly to the U.S. and uh, hope that the U.S. Uh, and uh, European allies could somehow uh, pressure Ukraine into some settlement uh, where Russia would either reabsorb Ukraine or Russia would uh, 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 partition Ukraine. So this notion that the U.S. Uh, is behind everything uh, in a way is... Uh, part of Putin's uh, effort to engage in talks over Ukraine directly with the U.S. But are there other people besides Putin who are blaming the U.S.? I mean, one thing that I'm hearing is that Ukraine Ukrainians didn't believe the U.S. Um, uh, information being shared uh, uh, by intelligence services, and uh, they were surprised. And so certainly this was a difference between 2014 and now that uh, in 2014, a decision was made not to share uh, the intelligence information that this uh, attack was going to happen. And this time we did share it and we did and the, and the British shared it. Um, does anybody have any thoughts on uh, the relationship between those news cycles and the intelligence forces? Mariana? Perhaps not necessarily the news cycle, but I just want to highlight that we're talking about criminal action. And I study criminals, among other things. And 
basically there, there's this theory that tries to explain how people can engage in criminal action, even though maybe they might have their honor code and how they can make sense of their actions that are going against the law and order, how they justify the whole theory that talks about justification. And what's interesting is that Putin's regime and Putin's government doing step by step following every parameter of that neutralization theory, such as, for example, one of the biggest one is denial of responsibility. And all the arguments about Russia have been pushed into specific action. If United States didn't say, uh, didn't share their intelligence, then, well, since you announced it, that we might as well should go forward. This kind of rhetoric we need to understand is a rhetoric. It's the argument and it's justification of the action to present one action as legitimate. But it is not legitimate. It is criminal. It's just criminals trying to make sense of their action and present themselves in a positive light that they're, it's not their fault. Uh, they also, another argument that's part of that neutralization is appeal to higher loyalties where, well, we're here to help to help Ukrainians, or we are here to, uh, what's this typical argument that lately Putin is using, denazification, which is utterly ridiculous, has nothing to do with reality. But all it is, is the argument, it's sending these words out of ether and trying to get these words bounce around in the global media and people actually believe in it as if they have a face value. There is no face value to them. This is just justification of the criminal. Well, the denazification is a question that we've been getting. Why does why is this term denazify coming up? Um, uh, Phil, do you want to address that? I was just going to say, um, Putin is portraying himself as the victim here. This is a defensive act in his, at least in the narrative that he is sharing. Um, he basically said that the Soviet Union made the mistake of appeasing Nazi Germany for too long and that Russia was not going to make the same mistake with NATO. Um, he thinks that NATO is going to get Ukraine to join and then use it as a springboard to invade Russia. Um, and he, the, de the denazification, well, he believes that the regime um, that has been in Kyiv since 2014 is basically backed by NATO and the West and um, that basically it has a Nazi tradition to it, which is unfounded. Again, well, this is this use of the word fascist, uh, the, the claim that that Ukrainian nationalists are uh, attacking Russians and are trying to are engaging in, in ethnic cleansing. Um, so those those he's turning those terms and using those terms. So when we see that denazification, we have to remember that there aren't any Nazis and there's no denazification to be done. It's just the rhetoric of the Russian state. And we have questions. Um, people are quite concerned uh, about why Putin started this war. And one of the questions that people are asking is about uh, the nuclear threats that we're seeing. Um, I don't know that we're none of us are really military specialists, but this, uh, this question, would, would Putin use nuclear weapons? It would be ironic to use them on Ukraine after Chernobyl. Yeah, Sean. Uh, I would say just uh, first off, uh, if uh, people saw in the news that uh, Putin uh, ordered basically the nuclear readiness uh, to be increased, uh, I want to uh, stress that this uh, Russia has four levels of uh, readiness. And basically, if one uh, is constant, uh, which is just a general uh, uh, state, uh, he raised it to a two. So it's not as if... Uh, this uh, declaration means that he is about, uh, he has the launch codes and he is about to strike. Uh, it just means it's level two out of four. Uh, and uh, the second point is that he is using this as intimidation. Uh, he is uh, the um, uh, Russian dissident, uh, Gary Kasparov, has uh, famously uh, described Putin as a poker player, basically, uh, and that uh, he thrives on bluffing, on uh, making it uh, appear as if he is uh, ready to, uh, to make these actions uh, and that we should not uh, reduce our uh, decision making. We should not uh, reduce what we plan to do based off of these threats uh, because he 
intends to uh, to declare these things to say the nuclear readiness has been increased because he wants to intimidate uh, because he is he is a bull he's a he's a uh, not to turn it into a schoolyard but he is a he is a bully what parts are neighboring uh, countries Moldova Georgia Belarus playing in the current events um, are these neighboring culture countries at all equipped or willing to lend support to either side, to Ukraine or to Russia? Um, and of course, we know this is one of the things that we fear uh, is, are they next? Is, is this an expansion that if, if Putin can, can manage to do something in Ukraine that he'll move into Georgia uh, again, uh, into uh, Moldova further, uh, into Belarus, even more than he's already there? I mean, the problem is that those are the three countries, of course, where there are, uh, there's a lot of Russian influence. Um, I would like to answer that slightly differently um, mm -hmm. than um, wondering, well, we know these countries are helping because they know they've been under the Soviet system. They know what life is like under the Soviets. But we, aside from all these tactics of a megalomaniac, we have to understand what's, I think, coursing through Putin's mind. Not that I'm a mind reader, but but he's shown over and over again that he operates on principles of grandiosity. Uh, uh, Russia as a superpower, Russia as the great Russia, uh, restoring uh, the land, restoring the control over those breakaway republics. Now, Ukraine was the second largest republic in the USSR. And I think it's worth taking note um, if you ask the question, why did he um, uh, invade now? We're in 2022, right? The USSR was formed in 1922. Uh, there would be an occasion for great celebration should he be able to reintegrate Ukraine back under his control. That would be a celebration beyond celebrations. And he's shown that mood twice. He showed it uh, at the uh, Sochi Games, which was quite a show of all that Russia stands for when it was basically an appropriation of, of cultural values from all the other republics. Uh, but, and then he invaded Crimea, but he waited until the end of the, of the Beijing Olympics and he invaded Ukraine. Now, I think the COVID kind of, mm, you know, blocked a little bit of the showmanship that he would have presented if possible. But these dates, these are not just happenstance. I think he thinks in those terms. He thinks in big kind of celebratory holiday terms. Uh, and part of that celebration is also commemoration of the founding of the Soviet army uh, and the founding of the Soviet Navy. And what would it have been had he been able, and I hope it'll never happen, had he been able to defeat Ukraine? Imagine what celebrations would be had by Putin. Uh, I think we have to keep that in mind as well. I mean, it functions as a, as, as a kind of motive for a person who is out of touch with reality. And that's a really good point, that 1922 point. Um, that, that Russian culture loves, or Soviet culture especially, but also Russian culture loves round dates, as we call them. Okay, so um, do you think that there is a solution through negotiation? This is a really important point. We are, we, they finished their first day of negotiating, they're gonna negotiate again tomorrow. Do you think that there is a solution? Will they be able to come? No, Mar uh, Mariana says no, Nikita says no, uh, Sean says no, Philip's very doubtful. Uh, I say no, but I say that there is one element of negotiation that should take place, and that is to create a corridor. You asked about the bordering countries, to create a corridor for humanitarian help. Uh, it should be untouched. It should be sterile. It should not have any activity whatsoever. You need to bring in food. You need to bring in the element, uh, all the elementary things that people need to survive this war. And that should be negotiated. Other than that, no contracts, no treaties, no uh, capitulation whatsoever. Cannot I'm, afraid, 
Yeah, I think that, you know, we remember that in, when with the Georgian invasion, it was short uh, in 2008. I, I think that Putin wanted to strike and have everything just be capitulated and have it be over. Uh, and we don't know, right? Will the Ukrainian people be able to hold on? And perhaps this is exactly, I, I think there's a brilliant idea, this humanitarian corridor, because that is precisely what is happening. As we've been watching, those of you who are paying attention, we see that refugee organizations are forming. There are uh, poles on the border uh, with pierogies and hot soup, handing them out to people as they come over. People are fleeing and they're getting help in other countries. But yes, getting a corridor into Ukraine would be key. Um, do you do you have uh, specific things? We'll try to have some resource lists of, of, of places that you can send money and help, ways that you can organize. We'll, we'll do, gather those together. Does anybody have anything right now that you want to say? Because I want to kind of ask our last question. We're coming towards the end here. I'm, I'm looking for organizations that uh, would help children. I think we've got, again, unfortunately and sadly, another generation of children of war and they need assistance. And so if there are organizations out there, I can't name anything right now specifically, I'm, I'm doing research on this, but children need assistance uh, immediately, immediately. And they're definitely being traumatized. Um, what is the, so here's the final question. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, go ahead, Sean, I didn't see your hand. No, go ahead. I was gonna ask the final question, which is, what is the most important thing about this invasion that you wanna make sure all Americans know? One sentence, each of you, what is that most important thing about the invasion that you wanna make sure all Americans know? Sean? Uh, I would say that uh, if you love a good underdog story, uh, Ukraine and its war, uh, right, U Ukraine fighting against Russia right now, uh, is a true underdog story, and uh, they need all the help they that they can get against Russia. Okay, thank you, Mikita. I would say that it's a lot more universal and global of an issue than just a local. Because if there is a war in Ukraine, they will everyone will pay their price: economic, um, cultural, ethnic, whatever, political, social. It will touch upon anyone. Absolutely. And the refugee crisis is happening again in Europe from a different direction. But you're absolutely right that this is going to touch every aspect of the global economy, culture, history, relationships. Miroslava? Um, I think first and foremost, we need to understand that Ukrainians are, are a peace-loving nation. Uh, they have fought over and over and over again to protect their borders and exist as a peace-loving nation. And I think it would be a tragedy should over this country that is Ukraine, that, that a country of over 40 million people should be sacrificed for any kind of comfort that Europe would have or the United States. I mean, just because we want lower gas prices or Germans want to be warm during the winter, Ukraine should not be uh, the, the sacrificial lamb in this desire. Thank you. And I just want to say that Ukraine um, is a big country and it has a big diaspora. We see it all over the world. We see all the supporters of Ukraine. It is a significant country that deserves this chance to uh, really hone the democracy, to really become uh, the part of Europe that it wants to be. Um, we as educators are very uh, committed to teaching about Europe, about the Russian Empire, about Ukraine, about the history, the language, the culture. Um, but I think that we can send that love to Ukraine, send that strength and send that love and strength and those, those passionate commitments that we have to our senators, uh, to our representatives. We have here in Ohio, senators and representatives who are very interested in Ukraine, very much focused on making sure that the US does the right thing this time around. So I wanna thank you so much. Did I let everybody have their final word? Philip, you didn't get yours. Okay, let's hear from Philip. No, I just want, Ukraine is important. And I think I could list off numerous reasons why, but a lot of people think in economic terms. Ukraine is the second biggest producer and exporter of grains in the world and feeds over 400 million people worldwide. It is crucial to our global food supply chain. Thank you. Mariana, one more sentence. 
I would like to add to Miroslava's sentiment um, in, in a way that the US administration and the rest of the world have been terribly complacent since at least 2008 with the invasion of Georgia and the invasion of, um, of Ukraine. Um, and this, this unprovoked aggression, it has to be responded to. We cannot be just uh, bystanders standing uh, our thoughts go to Ukraine and then do nothing. The, the time of do nothing is over. We really need to show the world the leadership that the United States is famous for. And if we cannot work together as part of the NATO, we can form against Russian aggression coalition with other countries who would stand with us and we should show this leadership and help Ukraine. Um, this is about civilization, this is about democracy, and this is about uh, the world global order, and we need to do something. Absolutely. Well, I'm going to I'm going to leave it at that. Thank you all so much. Thank you to our audience. Um, I'm grateful to Sean Conroy, Mariana Klotchko, Philip Kopetz, uh, Miroslava Mudrak, and Nikita Pishenko for sharing their time and expertise. Please join me in giving them a virtual round of applause. We would also like to thank the College of Arts and Sciences, especially Maddie Gurma and Alex Bixley, as well as the Center for Slavic, East European and Eurasian Studies and the Harvey Goldberg Center for Excellence in Teaching for their sponsorship. And once again, thank you, our audience, for your excellent questions. I wish we could have gotten to all of them. We really, really appreciate your engagement with this topic, and we will look forward to engaging with you further via email and in other ways. Um, Thank you again for your ongoing connection to Ohio State. Stay safe and healthy, and we'll see you next time. Slava Ukraini. Heroyam Slava. Heroyam Slava.